Well, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for returning for the afternoon session. Now, uh, with the rearranged uh, schedule, uh, Nancy is, um, is, we're really asking a lot of her to present uh, two different papers, um, as Mrs. Malaprop would say, uh, in concussion. <laughs> and, <laughs> And it's just a special uh, pleasure for me to, to welcome um, our American guest, Nancy, as well as her husband, uh, Mike, who's uh, come with her on this trip all the way, all the way down under. I, I told them that the trip, of course, going back up will take even longer because you are going uphill, and they understand these, uh, these differences in planetary activity. Now, I've been aware of Nancy's work uh, for some years, but it was only this past August that I had an opportunity to meet her in person at the American Chesterton Society conference which took place in Orlando, Florida. Um, wonderful, wonderful occasion and uh, Virginia and I enjoyed it uh, very much. But um, Nancy is uh, an award-winning uh, poet, a much published author of prose and she's done an enormous amount to promote an appreciation of the works, and the thought, uh, the sensibility of G.K. Chesterton in our time. She's done this in several ways. Uh, she's the author of a definitive biography of Frances Chesterton, Chesterton's wife, Frances, called The Woman Who Is Chesterton. Many of you will have seen this and hopefully purchased a copy. I know Nancy would be happy to inscribe it um, if uh, you haven't already prevailed on her to do that. <coughs> Uh, the author, Joseph Pierce, that, uh, who was mentioned earlier, has called uh, Nancy's book a great gift to the world of Chesterton scholarship. And she's also produced editions of Francis Chesterton's plays and poetry that are also available here. Uh, she's also an expert on the Father Brown stories, and she's adapted many of these stories for younger readers. We'll be talking about that in detail in her, um, in her talk this afternoon, and that's in two volumes. This is the first one, The Father Brown Reader, and there's a second volume of, uh, of other stories uh, as well that uh, she's adapted for younger readers. She's uh, also a regular contributor to a magazine called Gilbert, and Gilbert is the uh, magazine of the, the publication of the American Chesterton Society. It's uh, now edited by Dale Orquist himself, the president of the American Chesterton Society. Uh, and Nancy uh, also podcasts for the Society in the States with a show called Uncommon Sense, which can be found on iTunes. So, uh, you know, Chesterton's line about uh, uh, common sense not being all that common anymore. Well, we, we got plenty of evidence of that uh, this morning in Sophie's and David's uh, presentations. Now, at the recent uh, American Chesterton Society in Florida, uh, Nancy's great work was recognised by her receiving the Society's Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, I know she was uh, not expecting that, and uh, I think reflecting on it when I was talking with her later, she, she thought, well, it's only half a lifetime award. She's got so many more things to do, like coming down under to speak at Australian Chesterton Society conferences. But uh, visiting uh, Australia here, um, we're delighted to have her in the last uh, couple of days since they arrived. Uh, Mike and Nancy, with uh, Virginia and I, have been able to show them uh, around Sydney to some extent. And, uh, and also we went to the Blue Mountains yesterday, so at least uh, very quickly and uh, at a certain level, um, uh, they've had the opportunity to see just what, uh, what this great part of Australia offers. Uh, yesterday she spoke to a camping audience of, of staff um, uh, and students, and tomorrow she'll be speaking to a family-based audience, which uh, Gay Smith is organising on what would Chesterton read to children. But today, two papers that Nancy will be presenting, uh, and the first uh, is on uh, the other Chesterton, Francis, the woman who was Chesterton. Uh, and uh, I think at the conclusion of that paper, depending on how Nancy feels, we might um, just have uh, a Q&A on that and then move uh, 
to uh, her second paper, and I'll talk about that uh, after uh, the first uh, the first session this afternoon. So it's uh, uh, wonderful to have her with us, and uh, please join me in welcoming Nancy Brown. thought to myself, if I could just do maybe 20 more years of work, could I actually get a second Lifetime Achievement <laughs> Award? <laughs> that just, that doesn't seem right. Um, well, a few years ago, I was at the British Library looking at a folder of letters written to Francis Chesterton. I really didn't know what was in it. It just said, Letters to Francis Chesterton. When you're in the British Library, if any of you have done research there, there's a section where you can look at papers and you can take photographs of them. And there's another section where you can look at things and you can't take photographs of them. But after a few days, I'd gotten a little confused. So I was in the section, and actually there was a little sign in front of me, but I didn't look at it. And I had this folder, and I opened it up, and it was very, very much like this, just a manila folder. But when I opened it up, there were actual, the, the real letters that people had sent to Francis after Gilbert died. So these were sympathy letters and sympathy cards. And, and I had white gloves on, they had given those to me. And I, it was very thick. And I thought, I've got like two hours before the library closes. How am I going to go through all this? And the only way you're supposed to actually do it is to have this pad of paper and you can only have a pencil and you're supposed to write everything down that you want. So I thought, oh, yeah, I'm not going to get through this. So I got my camera out and I started snapping pictures, flipping them over, taking another snap. And pretty soon this got tapped. <laughs> and I turned around and there was a very large fellow. And he said, put that camera away or you will be kicked out of this library, and you will be asked to never return. <laughs> like, okay, put it away. So I started with my paper and my pencil, and I sat reading these sympathy letters, and I knew that Frances had opened every envelope. She had read every letter and probably had cried over these letters. And after a little while, I had to leave, but before I left, I looked around to see if the big scary man was around, and he wasn't. And I took my glove off and I just touched one of the letters. And I felt like I connected a little bit with Francis. So I'd like to tell you everything that I know about Francis Chesterton, but instead I'm going to give you a nice overview. And I want to help you appreciate how important she was to Gilbert. And if you want to know more today, I do have that book, uh, The Woman Who Is Chesterton. So I've been involved with the American Chesterton Society for about 20 years, and I first came across Chesterton as a freshman in college. I was assigned to read the book Orthodoxy, and I was 18 years old. In our whole freshman English class, we, we just didn't get this book. We we're too young, I don't know, we had too little time to analyze it, we had too little time to get it. Our professor was probably wonderful, but uh, we weren't having it. So we finally finished our two-week session on orthodoxy, and it was cold, it was winter, and we went outside after our class, and there was one of those big metal barrels that you throw trash into, and someone just said, let's burn these books. And someone had a match, and we did. We, we did. And that was my first experience of Chesterton. <laughs> well, that's pretty embarrassing. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think back, and I think, wow, I wish I had that book now, because I'd like to see what I underlined <laughs> and highlighted. But So that was that. 20 years later, I picked up the same book, Orthodoxy, and this time... I absolutely loved it. I began reading everything I could that Chesterton wrote and everything I could about Chesterton. And I discovered that he was married and I wanted to know more about his wife, Frances. But there was no more. 
There were no books, there were no articles, there were no websites. I did find an obituary. So let's start there. This is a good one. It was written by a good friend of G.K. Chesterton's, Edmund Clara Hugh Bentley. And he was a longtime friend of the family from even before he met his wife. So this is Mrs. Frances Chesterton. If Frances Chesterton is best remembered as the wife of Gilbert Chesterton, it is certainly not in the sense of her having sunk her individuality into that of her renowned husband. It is because theirs was so close and natural a union that those who knew them could hardly think of them apart. And so it was for their 35 years of married life. She was from the first a woman of firm personality and definite habits of mind, masked by a gentleness and quietude of manner due perhaps to her serenity of religious conviction. G.K.C. met her first in a circle in which a loose culture and a vague soulfulness were the fashion. And what interested him in her was an active dislike of all such laxity and aimlessness. She was practical. She was an organizer. She was, above all, a devout Anglo-Catholic. And her unparaded literary gift came out in the simple devotional poetry known only to her friends and treasured by them. G.K.C., when he met her, was a creedless pantheist. He became her convert. As he wrote in the dedication to the Ballad of the White Horse, I bring these rhymes to you who brought the cross to me. After he was received into the Church of Rome many years later, it was at her own time and by her own way of thought that she followed him. The basis of what he called his indefensibly fortunate and happy life were the devotion of his mother and the devotion of his wife. He passed directly from the care of one to the care of the other. Francis Chesterton made his household and home. And I just lost my place. Hold on a second. Made his household and home. And shared his every interest and was his right hand in all his dealings with the world. They had in common that goodness, which, as he wrote, is God's last word. Limitless charity, steady pursuit of the Christian ideal. They had humor, the love of friends, delight in letters and art. It was a perfect companionship. So I read that, and I wanted to still know more. I started searching. Why? I thought Frances held clues for me. I thought she must know something about being the wife of an artistic and intellectual genius, as I thought my husband was, and is the wife of an absent-minded professor type. I wanted to learn from her. I wanted to be her friend. I wanted to sit and have tea with her in the afternoon while we discussed our faith and our families and our husbands. So I began researching. My research took me from Chicago to London and ultimately to Beaconsfield where Francis and Gilbert are buried. I started at the beginning, how did they meet? To find out that I had to find out more about the Blogg family, B-L-O-G-G, -G, that was Francis's maiden name. Francis Alice Blogg, before she was Francis Chesterton, was the first born child of her family. Her mother, Blanche Blog, came from an artistic family of silkscreen and stained glass artists. Her father, George Blog, was a diamond merchant. Unfortunately, George Blog, her father, died of a heart attack in his 40s. Frances was 14 years old. She had two younger sisters and a younger brother. Frances' mother, Blanche, was an intellectual who read about experimental methods of education. Frances and her sisters attended the very first kindergarten that operated in London by two German ladies who had introduced it. Then Frances attended a girl's high school and went on to study at college. In those days, it was rare for young ladies to attend college, but not impossible. Frances had, was learning to be a teacher. However, when she was finished, 
rather than teach in a public school, she started teaching Sunday school and volunteered at a free school for poor children. She obtained a full-time position at the PNEU, the Parents National Educational Union run by Charlotte Mason. And it was in fact Charlotte Mason who hired her and was her boss. The PNEU was a new and growing organization that sought to help parents and governesses do a better job at teaching their children in their own home. Many homeschoolers follow the Charlotte Mason method even today. Francis was the general secretary, taking notes, typing up minutes, keeping track of the lending library, organizing conferences, writing articles for their two publications, and giving speeches at their local chapters. The Blog family lived in Bedford Park, the first suburb of London, immortalized in Chesterton's work, The Man Who Was Thursday, but called Saffron Park in the novel. Into this neighborhood, all of the loose wheels of London rolled. The Bohemians, the artists, the communists, the spiritualists, and the socialists. Um, the Blog family loved living there amongst those ideas and doctrines and economic theories of Bedford Park. However, Frances was a little different from her other family members. She had gone to college at St. Stephen's and she had met and befriended the Kluwer Sisters of St. John, a traditional Anglo-Catholic order of nuns. Frances loved the life they led and she began praying regularly, attending mass, reading her Bible, and admiring the saints and the liturgy. In other words, she began practicing the faith that she'd been born into but had never before adopted. Gilbert Chesterton said Francis was the first Christian he'd met who actually practiced her faith because Francis went to Mass every Sunday and read her Bible and lived the Christian ideal. So Francis stood out from the Bohemians in Bedford Park. She had her philosophy of life and she was prepared to defend it. The young adults in the Blog household decided to start, to start a debate club in about 1894, and they called it the IDK Debate Club. And when they were asked, what does IDK stand for, they were supposed to go, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and that was what it stood for. Some of you will recognize the name Lucian Oldershaw. Lucian was a good friend of Gilbert Chesterton's at his school, St. Paul's. Lucian was also part of the Junior Debate Club, which was the group Chesterton started, coincidentally, with his high school friends. At Chesterton's club, they discussed literary works, politics, faith, they held debates, they wrote stories and poems, and they eventually published a little newspaper called The Debater, where some of Chesterton's first works were published. So, back to Lucian. Lucian had been part of that Junior Debate Club, but now in his early 20s, he's living in London, He's working as a tutor. Gilbert, meanwhile, had gone to college and was starting to review books at Redways. He was writing his own critical reviews and they were being published, but anonymously. He was not famous. He was still unknown. He was also writing poetry in his notebooks and of his future love, he wrote this in his diary. Madonna Mia, about her whom I have not yet met. I wonder what she is doing now at the sunset hour, working perhaps, or playing, or worrying, or laughing. Is she making tea, or singing a song, or writing, or praying, or reading? Is she thoughtful as I am thoughtful? Is she looking out of the window as I am looking out of the window? Gilbert was ripe for love. <laughs> he had already had a few failed love affairs, which he wrote a lot of poetry and one book about, being young and full of emotion. He was 22 years old. Now, Lucian had brushed elbows with the members of the Bedford Park group and had been invited to the blog home for a debate one evening. And there, Lucian was introduced to Ethel Blog, Francis's younger sister and he thought she was beautiful. Ethel was the only blonde of the sisters and the only extrovert. She was lively and, and opinionated. Now, Lucian told his friend Gilbert about the house, 
the debate club, and the beautiful sisters. He had picked one out, he told Gilbert, but there were two more. <laughs> the next Sunday afternoon, when Lucian was invited to the blog house, he took Gilbert along. Now that particular day, Frances wasn't there. Gilbert met her sisters, her brother, her mother, and some of the other neighbors, but he was invited to come again. The second time he came, about a week later, the stars aligned. Francis was there. As soon as he saw her, Gilbert had this flash of insight. But let's let him tell the story as he wrote to a friend, and he's speaking in the third person. The second time he went there, he was plumped down on a sofa beside a being of whom he had a vague impression that brown hair grew at intervals all down her back like a caterpillar. <laughs> Once in the course of conversation, she looked straight at him, and he said to himself as plainly as if he had read it in a book, if I had anything to do with this girl, I should go on my knees to her. If I spoke to her, she would never deceive me. If I depended on her, she would never deny me. If I loved her, she would never play with me. If I trusted her, she would never go back on me. If I remembered her, she would never forget me. It was all said in a flash, but it was all said. Something about Francis was extremely <coughs> attractive to Gilbert. But something about Gilbert was also attractive to Frances. Her family was full of literary and artistic types, and perhaps she recognized that in Gilbert. Anyway, they began a courtship, and this included visits to the blog home most Sunday afternoons, and participating in the IDK debate club twice a month, and various other social functions. Gilbert had to pass the office where Frances worked on his way to work, and he would often stop in, go to her desk, draw something on the blotter so that when she came to work, she'd see his message. He picked forget-me-nots for her, and she pressed them in her diary. One day, Gilbert sat writing a letter to a friend, wondering what Francis was doing at that moment. Now hear the echoes back to his first poem. He wrote, I wonder how that young lady of mine is doing. I wonder what she is doing now. Cooking supper, perhaps, or reading Tolstoy, or entertaining Cousin George, or doing art needlework, or dressing for a party, or wishing she had the vote, or working a telephone, or visiting the sick, and keeping herself unspotted from the world. St. James again. I really feel quite interested in that girl. I assure you that compared to Nina, Nina is quite inferior. You wait till I find her out. Meanwhile, bother her for me. She is good. She is nice. She is polite. She is intelligent. She is sane. These things are scarcely novel. They are among the common objects of a morning walk. If you care to know ordinary conversation, we talked about laughter. And I said how sacred it was. And she said her monosyllable. By the way, not that it matters much, although she does say yes, she is really an acute, if not clever girl, I find. I really didn't know it until I began throwing out a few Christian reflections. She hasn't been broadened enough by reading, but when it comes to interior meanings, she's all there. So Nina was one of Gilbert's old girlfriends, and of course, Frances hadn't been brought enough by reading, so Gilbert wrote out a list of books for her to read. These included classics such as Herodotus and Cicero. But let's take apart some of the important points. Wishing she had the vote. Now, many of Frances' friends were suffragettes. Frances' mother actually had the vote because she was a woman head of her household. She could vote. Frances and her friends wanted all women to vote. Gilbert Chesterton believed one family, one vote, because he believed so strongly in the family as the basic unit of society, not in individualism. However, despite what you will read or hear, Gilbert did support Francis. 
and her interest in women's votes, and even gave a few talks in favor of women's suffrage. Visiting the sick. Now, Francis took the corporal works of mercy very seriously. Visiting the sick was something they would do all their married life. In fact, rather vi than visiting the sick, Francis often took the sick into her home and nursed them herself. She also visited prisoners and taught the poor. St. James again. Gilbert and Francis had a special connection to St. James at the time. There were several points of geographic connection. St. James Park, St. James Square, St. James Bridge, but then also St. James, the epistle writer of the Bible. She is sane. Now that theme of sanity weaves throughout Chesterton's writings. Who is sane? The person who uses their reason. Who is sane? The person of faith. Sanity is a marriage of faith and reason, and Francis is sane. She really is a clever girl. I didn't know it until I began to throw out a few Christian reflections. Frances knows her faith. She knows theology. Gilbert throws out Christian reflections, but doesn't yet quite believe them himself. But he comes to credit Francis with bringing him to Christianity. Before meeting her, he was a pantheist who believed in God. After meeting her, he was a Trinitarian Christian. She had evangelized him. When it comes to interior meetings, she's all there. Everything that Gilbert finds important, faith, practice of faith, intelligence, reason, sanity, he finds it all in Francis. And he finds her beautiful. He's in love, and he's found exactly what he wants. On Thursday, July 21st, 1898, in the middle of St. James Bridge, in the middle of St. James Park, they became engaged. They were married three years later on June 28th, 1901, Francis's 32nd birthday. Now what? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes baby in the baby carriage. That's what we used to sing when we were little. Right? Well, not for them. The first eight years of their marriage, they tried to conceive. Francis underwent an operation, and then a second, and then a third. There are no medical records left for us to determine what these operations were. But after the third, the doctor sadly informed Gilbert and Francis that they were unlikely to have biological children. But now comes the amazing part. Rather than become depressed, rather than get angry at God or the doctors, rather than hide from a world where babies are everywhere, Gilbert and Francis seem to have made some sort of silent pact. They would not adopt, although it was considered, but instead they would welcome children into their lives, into their home, and they would pay special attention to all the children they met. We heard that story this morning. It was so beautiful about it you know, playing with the kids on the train. They would eventually have over 25 godchildren. One child, Michael Braybrook, the son of Francis's cousin, stayed at their home in Beaconsfield during every school break for 10 years. The Chestertons paid for his schooling all the way through medical school. They are a beautiful example of spiritual motherhood and <laughs> spiritual fatherhood in action. These were not their biological children, but the Chestertons cared and loved for many, many children. They provided a listening ear, a shoulder to cry on. They gave comfort, comfort and advice. They taught them, prayed for them, and all ways were parents except biologically. We who are parents can learn from this to act as spiritual mother and father to those near us in need. And that those of us who are not parents can do the same. This vocation to spiritual motherhood and fatherhood is open to all, and it's a beautiful gift. Lucian Oldershaw eventually married Francis's sister, Ethel, and they had five children for Gilbert and Francis to love. Two of the girls came to visit uncle and aunt one time, and they came down with chicken pox while they were there, and Francis nursed them and kept them at her house for eight weeks. Hilaire Belloc, one of Gilbert's greatest friends, came down with pneumonia 
He stayed in the Chesterton spare bedroom for a month while Francis nursed him back to health. And there are many, many more examples such as this. So the Chestertons welcome children. Gilbert is making his living now as a writer and becoming more and more famous as the years pass. Francis, always shy and introverted, she finds his fame trying at times, but she bears with it using humor. Once while she was traveling in the United States and she gave numerous interviews about her husband, she was asked what she would be doing while Gilbert was giving his talks. And she said she would be organizing a campaign for the emancipation of wives of famous husbands. <laughs> now, the newspapers in the United States were very keen to interview Frances, so the newspapers in England started to notice her, too. A prophet is mostly unknown in her own country. They printed this. Mrs. G.K. Chesterton, like so many other clever wives of distinguished husbands, runs the risk, perhaps, of lacking that justice from the public which is her due. Yet Mrs. Chesterton has several titles to distinction. She is not only a spirited and practiced debater, but she writes occasional verse of the most rare and delicate beauty. She is likewise keenly interested in social reform. She's constantly presiding at happy evenings for the children of the slums and is a prominent supporter of the Christian socialist ideals. Well, Frances had a distinguished hus husband, but she never wanted the attention of the public. She was too humble for that. She would much rather write her poems and give them to friends, would much rather tend the sick and have no one notice her. But she was important to Gilbert, and for that reason, we must notice her. And we can learn much from her humility. We know plenty of famous spouses who want attention. Look at the whole Kardashian thing. You know, Frances wasn't like that. She looked after Gilbert, and Gilbert was humble enough not to let the attention affect him either. They were two innocents at home. Frances is an excellent example of spiritual motherhood. Gilbert is an excellent example of spiritual fatherhood. But together, paradoxically, they are excellent examples of spiritual childhood. Many hundreds, if not thousands of people, have read the works of Chesterton's and have been converted. Some, like C.S. Lewis, were atheists, and by reading Chesterton, he became a Christian. Some, like Father Ronald Knox, heard, Christ heard Chesterton speak and read his works and converted from Anglican to Catholic before Chesterton himself converted, and then Knox, who was converted by Chesterton in 1917, went on to help Chesterton with his conversion in 1922. How is that for a paradox? Just wrap your mind around that. Chesterton's writings converted Knox. Knox now helps convert Chesterton. It's amazing. Chesterton credited his conversion to, Christian, to Christianity to his wife, Frances. In 1922, Chesterton converted to Catholicism. Why? Because he believed it to be reasonable. He believed it to be sanity. It was the only church, he said, that could take away his sins. There were a thousand reasons for conversion, he said, all amounting to one. The Catholic Church is true. But what happened to Francis? She didn't convert when he did, although she was there sniffing. Their conversions were very different. Chesterton never really completely embraced the Anglican Church, even though he would go to services every Sunday with Francis. Francis, though, was a devout Anglican. She had been taught, as Anglicans were in those days, the branch theory, which stated that there were three legitimate branches of the Catholic Church, the Roman Catholics, the Eastern Orthodox, and the Anglican or Anglo-Catholics, as they were called. Frances believed this for a long time. She went to Mass. She loved the saints. She was devoted to Mary. She taught Sunday school. It was hard for her to believe that she was doing something that wasn't right. But after Gilbert converted, she struggled with the belief in the branch theory until she was convinced it was wrong. By Christmas of 1922, only six months after Gilbert's conversion, she already knew what direction she was headed, she said. However, because of illness, 
and fear, it took her until 1926 to actually convert. And then, finally, the two were again one. And now watch what happens. They had moved to Beaconsfield, but there was no Catholic church there. So the Chestertons helped to build one. They found a statue of Mary holding baby Jesus while they were traveling, and they gave it to the new church. It's still there. You can see it if you go visit. St. Therese of Lisieux, the little flower, had just been canonized in 1925, and so the parish was named for her. After Gilbert died, the money people donated was used to help build a side chapel in St. Therese's for the English martyrs, St. John Fisher and St. Thomas More. There's also a memorial stained glass window with a beautiful image of St. Francis of Assisi receiving the stigmata. Gilbert took the name Francis as his confirmation name. Sadly, no record remains of what name Francis took for her confirmation name. I'd be curious to know. Francis faithfully traveled everywhere with Gilbert. She came to the U.S. and Canada twice in 1921 and 1930. They traveled all over Europe, Eastern Europe, and the Middle East, and everywhere they went, Francis made sure Gilbert had his speech, his clothes were pressed, his shoes were tied. And although they never came to Australia, as you may or may not know, in 1936, the Chestertons had booked a passage to come here on a ship. They were going to come and visit you. Wasn't that nice? But they couldn't come. They had to cancel because Gilbert became very ill. His health rapidly declined, and he died on June 14, 1936. Francis was devastated. Her one true love, her life's companion, her hero, her friend, was gone. Her eyes at this time look lost and haunted. People came and visited. They wanted to see the home where he worked, where he lived. And Frances wanted to be hospitable, but she was deeply grieving. And she couldn't really share her grief with anyone. People began to realize they should stop talking about him. To her, it made her too sad. She got cancer, and she died two years after him in 1938. Her lasting legacy is as his wife, his one true love. True hearts at home, at the inn with the open door. They certainly were a unique couple. The Catholic Church is now seriously considering the question, was Gilbert Keith Chesterton a saint? And again, to be clear, there's no cause open as of yet, but there is an investigation. The investigation has been going ongoing for about five years, well, longer than that, since the 80s. Chesterton himself said, it is a paradox of history that each generation is converted by the saint who contradicts it most. Is he the saint that contradicts it most? And for a couple who were as close as they were, who shared as much as they did, whose lives were exemplary, I believe in the idea that they should be considered for canonization together. But there's one problem. Few people know who Frances is. Few are devoted to her. Gilbert had his following, and that's great, but let's get to know Frances better. Gilbert could not have done what he did, wrote what he wrote, or accomplished what he did without her. Gilbert would want us to know Francis better. So this is what I learned writing the biography of Francis, that she was talented and thoughtful, helpful and wise, that she was motherly without having her own children, that she was an excellent wife, filled with patience and endurance, that she was humble and stayed in the shadows, letting her husband shine in the light, that she knew sorrow and that sorrow did not overtake her that she knew death and didn't lose her faith, that she prayed and was devoted to Our Lady, and that she adored Jesus as a babe in the manger. If you happen to look up at the stained glass window inside St. Therese in Beaconsfield, the window directly behind the altar, where you'd normally expect in most churches to see a depiction of the cross. In St. Therese in Beaconsfield, I believe under the influence of Gilbert and Francis, 
That stained glass window shows the nativity. It's the holy family in Bethlehem and the baby Francis adored. Christmas was her favorite time of year. Now there is one poem of Francis's that really stands out. It's sublime. It was set to music, it's won awards, and it's sung each Christmas in England. And it's called, How Far Is It to Bethlehem? How far is it to Bethlehem? Not very far. Shall we find the stable room lit by a star? Can we see the little child? Is he within? If we lift the wooden latch, may we go in? May we stroke the creatures there, ox, ass, or sheep? May we peep like them and see Jesus asleep? If we touch his tiny hand, will he awake? Will he know we've come so far just for his sake? Great kings have precious gifts, and we have not. Little smiles and little tears are all we have brought. For all weary children, Mary, must weep. Here on his bed of straw, sleep, children, sleep. God in his mother's arms, babes in the byre, sleep as they sleep who find their heart's desire. How far is it to Bethlehem? Not very far. In many ways, this poem is simplistic. It almost sounds as if a child wrote it, but it is profound. Francis, like Gilbert, pondered the nativity, pondered the stable at the end of the world, where all souls meet, where they will find ultimately their heart's desire. And people were bringing children to Jesus that he might touch them, but the disciples rebuked them. When Jesus saw this, he became indignant and said to them, let the children come to me and do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Amen, I say to you, whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Gilbert and Francis are examples of many virtues, faith, trust, hope, charity, chastity, innocence, mercy, forgiveness, humor, and goodness. But perhaps the thing they embodied most was their childlike trust in God. And perhaps they were one of our best examples, along with St. Therese of Lisieux, of this virtue. And perhaps because of this, they may one day be declared saints. Gilbert and Francis, pray for us. Thank you. Anybody? Yes. Questions? Yes, we might, uh, if you were happy, we might take a few minutes of questions uh, before, uh, before the second paper. So, anybody uh, you think they'd like to ask about Francis Chesterton? Reader, please. Yes. Have a look at it there. Did you get back into the library to have another look at the lessons? I, 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 we were traveling, so I had about three days, and that was it. I, I did as much as I could. Um, but uh, she's. Uh, Canon Udris is uh, investigating the cause, and during his investigation, I was able to say, go to folder, you know, 14867, <laughs> and you have to read these letters, because some of them were, some of them were, you don't know me, Francis Chesterton, but our entire family was converted by your husband, and we just want you to know that. Why wouldn't they let you photograph them? Because they were the actual letters. They weren't copies. They were they were not copies of them. No, no. If you want to see them you have to go to the British Library right now. Yeah. Yeah, that's another it's another job. Well, there's still so many things to do with Chesterton and that's one of them. I'd love to have some book of all of that, you know. There's tons of correspondence that's never been written down anywhere. So work work left to do if anyone's interested and it's fun work. It's exciting work. The research is great. I loved it. The Vatican Library is the same. No, with the limited, yeah. You can't use camera. Yeah. <laughs> Did she keep any? Here, yeah, John. Then, no, okay. And then David. Put the book up. John. Nancy, Chesterton had many famous friends. Yes. And he had a brother who was a strawberry 
So the question is, um, Francis's relationship to other uh, members of the Chesterton family, in particular his brother Cecil. Um, Francis, uh, when they first uh, became engaged, their, each set of parents had the same exact opinion. Neither one was the right. That this was not going to work out there with the right people. Francis's uh, parent or mother thought that Gilbert was never going to make a living. Um, and uh, Gilbert's parents thought that Francis was too arty. They, they thought she, that's what they said, she was too arty. Um, but later in life, uh, Chesterton's mother told Francis that um, there were chalk pavement artists, you know, like, uh, like in Mary Poppins. There were uh, people who used to make the chalk pavement. Well, uh, Gilbert's mother always gave them money because she said, if not for Francis, if not for Francis, I was afraid that's what would have happened to Gilbert. He would have ended up a chalk pavement artist. <laughs> um, uh, Francis got along with Cecil very well. She got along in, later on, you know, with his parents very well. All the whole family. The only person that she did not get along with was Cecil's wife, Ada. Now they were like oil and water. They did not get along. A Ada was a journalist. Uh, she loved Fleet, Fleet Street. Uh, she liked being loud and boisterous with the boys. Uh, Francis was a home-loving person uh, who liked being quiet, and uh, they just did not. They did not get along. And Ada took out her wrath on Francis in her biography called *The Chestertons*. Yeah. So you want to see if you want to see some meanness in action there. Read that. So that, yeah, I, I don't have fond feelings for Ada, of course, because of that, because uh, she didn't like my, my girl, Frances. <laughs> so Ada and then Stephen. Yes, a related Stephen. question to John's. Just, did she keep any notes on her impressions of the famous friends like Bernard Shaw? Or she, uh, she, to her credit, um, she had them over for dinner all the time. The Shaws, the, uh, the Wells, they were, they were friends. Uh, there are several diaries that were kept normally she kept diaries during their travels but there's one diary and Aidan Mackey found it uh, in a notebook in the attic of uh, Dorothy Collins's house and it was a different notebook it was it was to keep track of something but when he flipped it over and opened the back there was her diary from like 1903 and it was Francis and it was all the people that they were having dinner with who they were invited here there some people were snobs some people were nice she did she wasn't expecting anyone to ever read this this diary, but it was completely reprinted in the Chesterton Review, uh, so I found it there, and you can read it yourself if you can get into the archives of the Chesterton Review. The whole diaries in there, yeah. So, but most for the most part, she's she's very down to earth. So she doesn't like people who are snooty and uh, you know affected. She likes people who are natural, and uh, she gets along with with people that she finds. She, could, she has lots of friends, so, uh, except for Ada. Touching on David's question, Nancy, yeah. was, it, was it Bernard Shaw who asked the question to somebody, uh, I can't remember who it was, it was Father O'Connor, uh, what did, after Frances died, what did she die of? Was it widowhood? Yes. Which was you know, a very poignant way of expressing... Well, here's a little surprise about Shaw. Okay, everyone thinks of him as, you know, this atheist and vegetarian, this tall, skinny, you know, op the opposite of Chesterton, really. Um, after G.K. died, he wrote a little note we hit that's in, in that folder. Um, why should I, an old man, live while he, a young man, die? If there's anything I can do for you, Francis, let me know, even if you need money. Let me know. And here's the other surprise. I was just reading. I just came across this um, 
uh, YouTube video, and it was a little mini movie about Shaw, which I'd never seen before. It was black and white. They said, to till his death, everywhere he went, he carried a Bible. Now that surprised me, because he tried so hard to not be a believer. You know, he was I'm an atheist. You know, just yeah. So. Why did he carry that everywhere he went? Maybe that's just one of those mysteries we will not know. Yeah. S S Stephen, you had a question? Sort of along that stream of because they knew and everything. They knew everybody. Uh, all, the, <laughs> all the famous, I mean, Chesterton was that famous. You know, everybody wanted him at their house, and they invited people back. They, they, you know, they did those at-home things. They'd open up their home in the afternoon. People would come over. They, they went visiting other people, there were lots and lots of social engagements, which, you know, so they, they did know, you know, it, it, if you get into the, the archives of some of the, the libraries, you see, you know, some of their connections. There's letters back and forth uh, to a lot, of, a lot of the famous authors and, and writers of the time. I know research has been done on that. I don't believe, I, I can't remember why there wasn't a connection with T.S. Eliot. I think because T.S. Eliot was just starting to write. Yeah, there was just a, a generational gap there. And also with the Inklings, they all considered Chesterton much, much older than them. So they were of the same generation, you know, um, C.S. Lewis and J.R. Tolkien, they're all kind of the same age, you know, maybe five years apart or something like that. But Chesterton was probably 20 years older than them. So there was, you know, just that sort of generational gap there. But Marcus? Yeah. Uh, you mentioned how there was concern whether they could pay the bills. Mm -hmm. um, I have in mind that um, Francis encouraged uh, G.K. to resurrect the Father Brown series because they were facing some financial difficulty. That's true. And Anytime would, they yeah. got behind a little bit, he... She would say, "Maybe you need to write another Father, Father Brown mystery." So and that that did bring in the money. Now later, later in his career, he did he did fine, and he when he went he made a lot of he didn't make a lot of money on books actually he didn't make very much money on his journalism. Where he started to do well was when he went on lecture circuits. Yeah, when he gave lectures, that's when he got got some money going there. So, yes. She got a Nancy. Yes, she did. Yes, she did. Um, she came on both trips. Yeah, he could. He could not have come without her. He he just could not. We would have it, got gone lost, wouldn't you? I'm in America. Where should I be? So, <laughs> <laughs> he he was so. It's hard to hard to explain how dependent he was on her. He was so dependent on her. Yeah, yeah. Peter, the uh, new um, uh, UK Father Brown yeah. TV series has been panned. Uh, uh, and rightly so, in my view, I think it's terrible. But I just want to know what you thought of it generally. Is it is it helping to um, bring Chesterton's name to the fore? Is it doing any good at all? It seems a dreadful series to me. But is it doing any good at all? What's your thoughts? Well, the good news is, is when they roll the introduction, they do say based on the stories of G.K. Chesterton, which is great if you pay attention to that sort of thing. Um, Dale Alquist, the president of the American Chesterton Society, says this, and I will quote him. He says, it's, it's interesting because they have a character who has the same name as Chesterton's, <laughs> as Chesterton's Father Brown. That's, a, that's about all you can say. So there are, there are people, though, that are being introduced to Chesterton by that, so it's hard to say it shouldn't be done because it is helping. It is helping. Yeah. We might just move on. Uh, other questions could wait for the panel discussion, perhaps uh, after afternoon tea. But uh, uh, Nancy, thank you so much uh, uh -huh. for that. This is brought oh, to, 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 to light and, and to life. I think a person who obviously is was immensely important to Jetson, and as, as Nancy said early in her talk, um, we, we uh, almost certainly wouldn't be here. Uh, as part of the Australian Cheston Society if it wasn't for what uh, Francis did for Gilbert. So uh, please join me in thanking everyone.